Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello we will discuss Percy Bysshe Shelley in this lecture and his ode to the West Wind. We see the historical literary context of Shelley and his life, his views on poetry from his essay on a defense of poetry. We read the poem, analyze the poem linguistically, rhetorically and then we have our own linguistic reading from a critic. And then we have a very interesting reading called ICT reading that is information and communication technology reading. I hope you will enjoy it. First the historical and literary context. This is common to all romantic poets. We have this American revolution, the French revolution, the reactions of the British people to these various revolutions. And also we have this Peterloo massacre which suppressed the voice of common people at St. Peter's field in Manchester which in fact irritated poets and many public. Two major thinkers influenced romantic poets in general especially Shelley one is William Godwin another is Thomas Paine. We also have this publication of lyrical ballads in 1798 announcing this romantic movement. Percy Bysshe Shelley was an aristocratic by birth and an idealistic rebel by choice. He could have easily lived a very comfortable life but he chose to rebel against his own society and suffer throughout his life. He was opposed to monarchy and authority. He was influenced by William Godwin and Thomas Paine because of their own democratic free thoughts and views. A strange case of this elopement with women and poetry we have in Shelley. He was a very interesting person in that case. He supported atheism, Irish nationalism and vegetarianism which were not so common in those days. He became a, the Promethean and satanic hero that he read and wrote about in his own poems. He is known for both long and short poems. Some of the well known poems are Prometheus Unbound, Hardness, T. S. Skylark and of course Woe to the West Wind. Shelley seriously interested in the poetic art defended poetry. He wrote an essay called A Defense of Poetry in 1820 but it was published only in 1841. We can consider this the poetic credo of Shelley proclaiming the visionary and prophetic role of the poet. Shelley prefers the imaginative mode of understanding of life to the rational mode. He believes that poetry can synthesize and unify disparate elements to create harmony in the world. For him poetry can reveal the truth by removing the veil of familiarity from the world. He considered poetry to be a liberator and so we can say the poet is a hero. This is the most famous statement from this essay on a defense of poetry. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Let us come to O to the West Wind now. This is a widely recognized masterpiece of Shelley despite the critical hostility against him. He was criticized by various uh, readers of his day and people who came after him. They were not happy with the kind of uh, expressive emotions that we find in his poetry. However, this poem is considered to be one of the greatest poems. This was written in 1819 and published in 1820. It has 70 lines in 5 stanzas. Each stanza is like a sonnet, an independent sonnet with 14 lines but they are put together. Shelley has used this terza rim format with a couplet. In this poem the west wind is a destroyer and also a preserver. 
further it is also a savior and regenerator of a just and equitable life and society. Let us begin with this poem directly now. O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. Yellow and black and pale and hectic red, pestilence stricken multitudes, O thou who charioteth to their dark wintry bed the winged seeds where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow her clarion over the dreaming earth and fill driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air with living hues and odors plain and hill. While the spirit which art moving everywhere destroyer and preserver here o oh here thou on whose stream mid that steep sky's commotion loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean angels of rain and lightning there are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge like the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce minute even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height the locks of the approaching storm thou dirge of the dying year to which this closing night will be the dome of your vast sepulcher vaulted with all thy congregated might of vapors from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail will burst over oh here. Stanza 3 Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams the blue Mediterranean where he lay lulled by the coil of crystalline streams beside a pumis isle in base bay and so in sleep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves intenser day, all overgrown with azure moss and flowers, so sweet the sense veins picturing them, thou for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean, know thy voice and suddenly grow grey with fear and tremble and despoil themselves oh here stanza four if i were a dead leaf thou mightest bear if i were a swift cloud to fly with thee a wave to pant beneath thy power and share the impulse of thy strength only less free than thou o oh, uncontrollable if even I were as in my boyhood and could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven, as then when to outstrip thy sky speed scar seemed a vision, I would never have striven. As thus with thee in prayer in my sore need, O oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. A heavy weight of ours has chained and bowed, one too like thee, tameless and swift and proud. Stanza 5 Make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep, autumnal tone, sweet though in sadness. Be thou spirit fierce, my spirit. Be thou me, impetuous one, dry me dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth and by the incantation of this verse, scatter as from an unextinguished hearth, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind, be through my lips to unawaken the earth, the trumpet of your prophecy, O wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. The trumpet of a prophecy, O oh wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. This is considered to be one of the greatest poems as we said earlier and the last line, if winter comes, can spring be far behind is the essence of romantic optimism, especially of Shelley. Let us see the thematic contrast here. On the one hand we have wind and earth 
like this we have west and east, dark and light, dream and reality, life and death, destroyer and preserver, heaven and ocean or hell, fire and rain, controllable and controllable, man and nature, harmony and disharmony, spirit and body, winter and spring, dirge and ode. The poetic devices are listed here for us. Apostrophe we find in the poet's address to the wild west wind. Oh, wild west wind, he addresses the wind throughout the poem. We have assonance and consonants in this first line itself, wild west wind. Wa is a semi vowel, so we call it assonance, and this da sound represents consonants, so we have consonants here. We have increased the uh, shape of W to indicate how it progresses. Wild west wind, then we have personification in this line, the breath of autumn's being. This wind is the breath. Autumn is personified as a being with the power. Then we have simile and inversion like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, like ghosts from a fleeing enchanter would be normal word order. So, we can consider this a word inversion. Then we have assonance and consonants in this line, yellow and black and pale and hectic red. Some of you who can remember polysyndeton can also see this and, and, and here in this case. Assonance and consonants we have in the next line as well, pestilence stricken multitudes. Metaphor we can see a night, the dome of a vast sepulchre. Further we can see metaphor in seeds and words, earth and mind. Further we can see simile a leaf, a cloud, a wave. The figuratively the poet wants to be associated with the leaf, the cloud, the wave and all that. We have the most famous rhetorical question in English literature in the last line of this poem. If winter comes, can spring be far behind? We have some rhyme, rhythm and meter in this poem. The rhyme scheme is ABA, BCB, CDC. D E D and so on. This is the example of the Italian terza rima. We also have a couplet at the end of every stanza A A. This is a rare rhyme used by Dante in his divine comedy, but Shelley has attempted in English poetry. We have the usual traditional iambic pentameter with some variations here. The trumpet of your prophecy, O wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. Further, we have one more rare instance of an iambic hexameter, that is, we have 12 syllables in this line, shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean. So, we have 6 feet in this particular line. To give an overall impression of this poem, we can list these following points. The poet addresses the west wind as a symbol of a revolutionary spirit to bring about radical changes in the world to establish an egalitarian world, where everyone will be considered equal. He uses the free terza rima form and the restrained sonnet form to express his uncontrollable anger for the noble cause of a harmonious society. We have to remember that Shelley was born in an aristocratic society. He enjoyed everything, but he found his own people suffering for various needs. The poet co-opts the natural power of the wild west wind to lift him and spread his words of equality and liberty throughout the world. He recognizes the constraint of a natural cycle from seeding to birthing for renewal through destruction. A critic called Pixton has offered this linguistic reading by noting the commands or the imperatives in this poem. There are six commandments or imperatives in this poem. O oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. The next one, make me thy liar even as the forest is. The third one is, be thou spirit fierce, my spirit be thou me, impetuous one. Fourth, Dry my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken any birth. Next, 
scatter as from an unextinguished heart ashes and sparks my words among mankind and the last be through my lips to unawakened earth pixton shows how the poet initially makes supplications but moves to the possession of the immortal power from the west wind initially he requires a wind and later on he gains that power and becomes an immortal power himself in his own poetry as we said earlier we have a very interesting case of this ict reading that is information and communication technology reading today www is a norm that is a virtual world we live in this world wide web is actually a collection of information to operate this we need this internet this is a global network of networks which enables the information traffic freely move from one part to another part of the world we find this www in shelley or in his poem the wild west wind what is the internet in shelley that is the written and printed poem that we have today shelley can be found in so many websites so we can say the wild west wind on the internet scattering and spreading the revolutionary idea of how we fall on the thorns of life and how we need to lift ourselves and our society removing the film of familiarity all kinds of social media today do what shelley was trying to do through his poem what to the west wind in his own day he exhibits this spirit of optimism throughout the poem especially in the last line if winter comes can spring be far behind this poem and many other poems all the ideas the voices of people are found on various websites poems are found on the website of poetry foundation representative poetry online and in many blogs so we can say this communication technology has done what shelley was doing in his own day through this uh, poem or to the west when in summary we have seen the historical and literary context in which shelley was writing his poems his critical essay a defense of poetry we saw this poem o to the west wind expressing the spirit of optimism we find in romantic poetry we analyze the poem linguistically rhetorically and then gave our own overall impression one of the critics who identified the list of imperatives in the poem uh, has offered a linguistic reading saying that the poet becomes a spirit at the end of the poem we also added this ict reading to indicate that the spirit of voice of people will always come through different forms as shelley has shown in his o to the west wind which now today we can connect with the world wide web which is very useful to us through the internet conveying spreading scattering the voices of people all over the world some references are here you can enjoy reading some of these essays we have to notice one special journal keats shelley journal it's very interesting to see some of the poets are able to inspire people to launch journals like this and then continue this journal for a long time for posterity thank you